it's always terrific when your slide deck actually comes up and works. That's a first step <laughs> in any of these talks. Um, so people are welcome to come and go as they need to. Um, I won't take offense, but I hope you'll find what I have to say interesting today. Um, the first thing I want to talk about, and I, I want to say how much I've learned myself here um, at the TACA meeting, um, as a parent of a child with autism, I actually have a 22-year-old son. Uh, Jack is actually doing quite well. He's a senior um, at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater in a learning supported program. Um, but it's been a long journey. Um, and he actually wasn't diagnosed until he was seven, um, which was one of the motivations for trying to get a better diagnostic earlier. Um, and even then, when he was diagnosed, he was diagnosed with pervasive developmental delays, not otherwise specified. We don't have that anymore, but it used to be a thing, uh, called PDD-NOS. It's now been rolled up in the DSM-5 into the regular autism diagnosis. And granted, it was 15 years ago that he was diagnosed, but they never used the word autism with us. And I don't know if it was the big scary A word or why it was, but um, we kind of had to learn on our own, even after he was diagnosed, that in fact what he had was autism. And a lot of opportunities opportunities were missed because of that. I think he's done pretty well and the school district was very supportive with behavioral uh, intervention, speech language, OTPT. But when I look around at the resources that are now available here at conferences like TACA, I think of all the things I wish I had known and the opportunities that maybe were missed by the late diagnosis that my son had and the lack of all the knowledge that we have. So I think, um, I hope what I'm going to talk to you about is First of all, a little bit about our journey. Secondly, about what we're doing at NeuroPoint to try to um, intervene earlier and more precisely. Um, and the science of what we do, because we're a very heavily science-driven company. We want to bring forward products that we think are grounded in good clinical data that will help you to decide what to do as an intervention for your children. So a little bit about the company. I founded this company um, in 2007 um, with a scientist from the University of Wisconsin um, and have run it ever since. And we're experts in a science called metabolomics. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that and why that should be interesting to you. But simply put, metabolomics is the study of your metabolism, just like genomics are the study of your genes. And over the course of the last 12 years, we've built a very robust, I would say the best in the world, platform for studying questions of metabolism using metabolomics. Um, we also have now a CLIA laboratory where we can deliver our diagnostic test, and I'm going to talk to you about that. Um, and we're able to do things in a very, very precise manner to understand what's different about the metabolism of children with autism versus typically developing children, and also across the spectrum. So we all know what autism spectrum disorder is. Um, for better or worse, it's part of the reason we're here. Um, the one point I do want to make about autism spectrum disorder um, is it's a very diverse and heterogeneous syndrome. So we accept that. Um, kids with autism may be very cognitively abled or cognitively disabled. They may have repetitive behaviors or they may not. We understand that they have very diverse genetics. Um, and it turns out they also have very diverse metabolism. And understanding their metabolism can help us to diagnose sooner and also to pinpoint the interventions that we all take as we try to figure out how to improve the outcomes for our kids. So there have been a ton of genetic studies, and there are a ton of studies ongoing. And genetics are important. But genetics are also a long way from the person as you stand. So not to belabor biology, but those of you who've studied genetics, we go through transcription and translation and protein synthesis and finally arrive at who we are as we stand. What we like about metabolomics is that we can look at the metabolism of children with autism, and I'll talk to you about this in some detail, diagnose earlier, look and see what's imbalanced in their metabolism using a high degree of precision, and then try to decide what to do to intervene based on the metabolism of the individual child, not the syndrome as a whole, not everybody treated the same, because we know that that doesn't work uh, perfectly. So metabolomics. I told you that we like this because it is who you are as you stand, but it takes into account many of the underlying um, aspects of biology in your environment. So you have certain genetics. 
but you may not actually express a defect unless it intersects with something in the environment. So we have had lectures about glyphosate, for example. It may be that there are genes that we have not yet associated with autism that are triggered by exposure to environmental toxins um, or by the food and drink that we eat. Um, what we like about metabolomics is that we look at the end product of all of those factors and try to understand who you are as you stand. Now there's a simple example that I would give you that will help you to understand um, how we use metabolomics and byproducts of metabolism to diagnose and treat. Um, and that would be the example of diabetes. So glucose is a small molecule we could measure with our, our platform. If glucose is high, you have diabetes. And we treat you with modified diet and insulin therapy to try to regulate the level of glucose. We don't actually need to know if your entire family has a genetic predisposition to diabetes and everyone gets it at a certain stage, or whether you had a virus that damaged your pancreas's ability to produce insulin. In every case, if we measure glucose as being high, we intervene with modified diet and dietary and, and insulin therapy. And so this gives us an opportunity, and hopefully it helps you to understand how studying metabolism can offer an opportunity opportunity for diagnosis and more precise treatment that takes into account all of the things that might impact how you got to where you stand with your metabolism without having to really understand everything about the biology of how you got there. So um, this is actually a slide I stole from Dr. Rosignol and I've been attending a lot of the MAPS doctor's um, uh, presentations because um, while not all of us have access to doctors who have studied metabolism and testing and trying to understand how to intervene, what I took away from this slide, and he does have it as his most important biological concept in his presentation if you attended it, is that um, autism is a biological condition. It's actually a spectrum of biological conditions that are manifested in behaviors. And I can't tell you how much resistance we get from typical behavioral assessors to the idea that this might actually not be a behavioral disorder, but in fact a biological disorder or constellation of biological disorders that manifest in certain behaviors. And the example I would give you is that two generations ago people would say I have cancer. And then, probably a generation ago, we understood that breast cancer was not the same as prostate cancer or brain cancer. And today we understand with companies like Foundation Medicine that even within a tissue type, some breast cancers will respond to Herceptins, others are incapable of doing so. And using this kind of precision medicine, we're starting to unravel the mystery of the constellation of disorders known as cancer. I postulate to you that in 10 years, we will understand the biology of the biological phenomenon of autism spectrum disorders, and we will break it down into individual therapies, some dietary and some pharmaceutical, that will address the actual biology of these kits. And this is just the beginning of what we're doing here. So this is my very cute son, Jack, who's now 22. He was three in this picture. And um, at that point, we knew he had some developmental delays. He had some language uh, issues, um, some motor, fine motor and gross motor issues. But he was a sweet and beguiling kid with a decent um, disposition. And maybe because he had a very chatty older sister, our physician took the attitude that, well, he's a boy, and she's a girl, and she's very verbal, so let's check him next year at our well baby checkup. Now, I don't blame my physician. I don't think he had the right tools to make that assessment, but the fact is time was lost, and because we had no better way to understand what he might respond well to, um, we did, of course, therapy, which every child should get, no matter what the biology is. But we did modified diet, many different kinds, and those of you who've done that and had to clean out your pantry and load it full of organic fruits and vegetables and grass-fed animals know it's an expensive and difficult thing to do. He did actually respond pretty well to the paleo diet, and yet we thought it was what we took out, the gluten, the casein, the sugar, the contaminants that actually made the difference with acuity and attention. But in fact, it might have been what was left, which was a lot of protein. And this is about the biology I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. We also did lots of vitamins and supplements, um, three kinds of attention deficit medicine, um, which only gave him reflux and made it so he couldn't sleep, but didn't really help with attention. Um, and so it was this journey that inspires us to try to be more precise. Um, we have some really important collaborators here, and they kind of fall into two categories. David Amaral has been um, our collaborator since back in 2010. He's the director of research at the Mind Institute at UC Davis. 
um, and an academic scientist through and through. So his work is very much on research um, and understanding the research that's current and helps us design our clinical studies. He's been a great friend and a great mentor to us. Recently, we added Marvin Nadowitz. So he's a physician on the front lines. He studies genetics and metabolism in neurological disorders and other rare diseases at Cleveland Clinic. So he'd be a little bit more like a MAPS doctor. He, t he orders the kinds of tests that we offer and that you all probably have had for your kids. And then he looks for interventions based on what is their metabolism? So as we've gotten to a place where we're about to commercialize on full scale this test that hopefully will diagnose sooner and point to more precise treatment, we want doctors um, like Dr. Rosignol and uh, Dr. Nadowitz to help us understand how did, what information do they need to help their patients. So this is our first paper that we published in 2014 on a pilot study we did in bank blood samples from the Mind Institute at UC Davis. And I still remember when I called David Amaral at the end of 2010 and I said, I hear you have some bank blood samples and we want to do metabolomics on them and let me tell you what we've been doing. And after probably 10 minutes of my talking very quickly and lots of information, he says, you're who from where and you want to do what? <laughs> <laughs> and so I backed up and I said, well, wait a minute, let me write you a white paper about what we have done, um, cellular models and other systems, postmortem brain tissue, metabolomics of kids with autism, and let's see what we could come up with together. And so he allowed us to have these very rare samples that had been kept in the minus 80 freezer for 10 years. And he said, if you could do a good job with these, then I'll let you have these current ones that we have now for the Autism Phenome Project. So this was a result of that work. We actually finished the work in 2012 and it wasn't published till November of 2014. So when you're trying to do science with peer review and publication, it's a process, but it's also important because it helps to bring the progressive community of autism people that often attend meetings like this together with the more traditional academic scientists. And as you may know, there is a bit of a um, headbutting that goes on between these two. So we're trying to sort of bridge that by taking care of both aspects of business to show the rigor of peer-reviewed science and publication, but also the innovation that I think many of the people that are, are here uh, represent. So this was a proof of concept study and basically what we found was we could take 75% of the patients and we could use our metabolomics platform to analyze their blood, uh, plasma, and we could actually then take the other remaining holdout set, the 25%, and we could build a model that could predict with 81% accuracy the um, fact whether the child had autism or was typically developing. And so that was sort of an aha moment. We're on to something here, right? But what was disadvantageous about this is it took about 80 small molecules to drive the model, and it didn't tell us very much about biology because there were just too many things happening at once. So from there, we actually conducted two more um, bank blood studies, a second one from the MIND Institute, finally the valuable samples from the Autism Phenome Project. Um, David was convinced that what we were doing was adding a whole next generation of thinking to all the genetic studies that had gone on, a multi-omics modality, if you could think about it that way. And so we actually screened 495 kids um, in total in the two MIND studies um, and then also samples from Jill James's lab at Arkansas. Some of you may be familiar with her work with Richard Fry in metabolism of, of autism. And what we found was that in each of the three studies, we could actually predict with about 80% accuracy by taking 75% of the kids, creating a model, a signature, if you will, a single signature of small molecules, and projecting them back on the holdout set of 25%. But unfortunately, what we also learned is we could not reproduce those across studies. In other words, the signature from MIND1 did not reproduce with a 80% accuracy in MIND2 or in Arkansas. The accuracy would fall, and we see this with other single signature studies that happen because why would that be? Well, we don't expect the kid with autism to show up with the same cognitive ability or the same behaviors or the same genetics, so why are we trying to force metabolomics to do something that none of those other things would allow? So when we grab 87 kids in the first study and then we grab another 175 in the second study, guess what? They don't have the same metabolism. But what we did learn was that there were subtypes of small molecules we could reproduce with high accuracy across studies. So we took the Arkansas study and we identified groups of amino acids, energy metabolites, microbiome byproducts of the microbiome that we can see in plasma, and we projected them back on the Mind Institute. And sure enough, we found good re reproducibility, and we were on to something, a stratification of the patient population based on metabolism into subgroups. 
And so the next thing we thought was we, we need a big clinical study for this because as you can see from the table here, the kids had different fasting states. They were either fed or fasted. They were different ages. The anticoagulants were in the tubes were different. And all of those things can impact metabolism. We knew for metabolomics, we wanted a first of the morning blood draw um, just like you don't get um, your glucose or cholesterol tested after having a sweet roll, we can measure that too. Um, we needed first morning blood, and we needed a highly well curated st uh, study, and it needed to be big because if we were going to describe subtypes of kids that had uh, incidence of about 5% in autism, we needed a lot of kids in order to have a meaningful N. Um, and so we recruited 1,102 kids. Um, and they were at eight sites across the country. Each of the kids got a research reliable ADOS2, which is actually a little bit higher standard or extra credential that you have to get, because we really needed to make sure that if the child was diagnosed as autistic as much as we could, they were actually had autism, and the neurotypical kids were neurotypical. So each of the kids also got a Mullins um, a developmental quotient to try to understand whether they were typically de developing or at whether they had autism. And there is actually a cohort in this group that's uh, developmentally delayed, but not autistic. And so this work was funded by a grant from the National Institutes of Mental Health, a $2.7 million three-year grant. And also, fortunately for us, because we're a small biotech, we were able to get funding from the Nancy Lurie Marks Family Foundation. Um, they are actually have an adult in their family with significant impairment from autism. But you might recognize the name Jeffrey Lurie as he owns the Philadelphia Eagles. So they're a family with we are with all who have interest in autism who helped to fund this study and make it possible. Um, it started out that we wanted to recruit 1,500 kids. We thought it would take eight, um, 18 months at six sites. Recruitment of children for a first of the morning blood draw is not the easiest thing to do, as you might imagine. And so we ended up adding two sites and dropping back to 1,100 kids because, frankly, we just couldn't sustain it economically any longer to continue this study. But 1,100 kids is enough to do good work with. And we got first of the morning blood from all of them as well as genetic samples in urine if they were able to give a voluntary sample. Um, and it is the largest study of the metabolism of children with autism by about 700 kids. And I would posit one of the best curated in terms of metadata around um, their health history, the parents' history, gestation and delivery, supplements, diet, and all the things that we want to look at to say, if we find a subtype, we want to make sure it's not because they're all taking you know, some supplement or some medicine. So the sites um, are very prestigious. Many of them are part of the Autism Treatment Network. Um, and you'll recognize many of these. They are actually participating right now in our beta program where you can order the test. And we do have a few other sites um, throughout the country. But as a little biotech, we actually need to scale up a commercialization team and physicians to help educate and interface with doctors. And so that's part of our effort right now. But these sites were involved in the clinical study, so they know how to draw the blood and how to prepare the sample. And it's not a very complicated. It just has to be sun spun down into plasma. But what is complicated is it has to be first in the morning blood, and it has to be um, put in the minus 80 or on dry ice within an hour because otherwise metabolism happens in the tube and it messes everything up. So that's where we have to have a site that really knows what they're doing and also a pediatric phlebotomist that's used to dealing with kids who may be squirmy or nervous or scared. So that's really important too. So the result of this work um, was published in Biological Psychiatry in September um, and we were really proud of this because um, this is the first study that really uses the rigor of um, a large clinical study to look at metabolism um, of autism. And what we discovered here was actually a dysregulation in amino acids, which is fairly well known in autism um, and may even be detected in some of your children. But what was missing and what's new is the precision that we can bring with 1,100 kids to actually look at where is the threshold? What combinations make a difference? You'll see that many of these kids would actually be in the normal range for an amino acid panel if you ordered it from LabCorp or Great Plains or Genova. Um, so what we're trying to do is set some precision around this and to start to address this subtype by subtype based on the metabolism of these children. So what you'll notice here, these box plots, the children um, with autism are in the red on the left and the typically developing children are on the right. And if you just looked at the mean values of these amino acids, there would be nothing interesting about them. They would not be um, drawing your attention. But if you look at the little blue boxes, for example, up in the upper left-hand corner for glycine and serine, and on the lower right for the branched chain amino acids, you'll see that there are 
a set of patients that have very low levels of branch chain and higher levels of other amino acids. And so we began to focus on these extreme values and how could we understand the correlation between um, things that uh, share a common enzymatic and transport biology to unearth or um, bring forward subtypes that otherwise might be missed in just a general study of the, um, of the levels of these amino acids in autism. So this slide shows the co-regulation of a, a group of small molecules. And I don't know if I have a laser pointer here. Let's see. Oh, geez. That was a bad decision. OK. Whew. That could have been terrible, people. You just don't know how bad it is when your, your PowerPoint goes down. OK. We won't try to point. But let's just say, look horizontally, there's a box. And this is the glycine cr cluster of amino acids that are higher in the kids that have this subtype. And then if you look at the vertical box, um, which is the branch chain amino acids and phenylalanine. In the intersection of those, you see a blue square where those things are negatively correlated. In other words, the glycine amino acid group are high and the branch chains are low. And this is interesting because they share common enzymatic activity and transport biology. So we're seeing something here where we really expected um, the, are you rescuing me with a clicker? Yeah. Show me how to work it. Great, thank you. I can do that without breaking anything. Hmm. Maybe I needed more instructions. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know how to work it. But the, the blue box, um, the blue box is the intersection of those things, and this is where we focused our attention. So I'm not going to science you to death here. Don't get scared. But this is branch chain catabolism basically the breakdown of certain amino acids through a, a cycle that includes uh, an enzymatic. Uh, uh, complex for breaking down branch chain amino acids. On one side, you see something that's called MSUD or maple syrup urine disease. This is a known inborn error of metabolism where kids have really high levels of branch chains. They have neurodevelopmental issues and other serious medical issues affecting their major organs if they're not intervened with by removing branch chains. On the other side, where you see the branch chain kinase keto dehydrogenase. Kinase. I think I got that right. I'm looking at Bob, my COO, who's the biochemist, and he's chuckling. So I was close. But this complex is responsible for the enzyme that breaks down branch chain. And it's known in a family in the Mediterranean that is uh, intermarries. They have a genetic defect where they have very low levels of branch chains. And their kids have autism, epilepsy, and neurodevelopmental delay. And so this um, defect in their case is very severe. But what we think we actually see here is a very similar but yet more subtle imbalance of the branch chain amino acids with um, the higher levels of amino acids. So this is a paper by Navarino et al. and Joe Gleason's group in San Diego, which they made a rodent model that mimics this genetic of this Mediterranean family. And these rodents have autistic-like behaviors, um, and they also have very low levels of branch chain amino acids with high levels of the other amino acids. And you can see here in the center the um, dotted line is sort of the mean value of what we'd expect for the level of these uh, small molecules. And the branch chains are below that by a considerable amount. Um, and many of the other e amino acids are higher. At the top, you see the Y system and the L system. And these are actually two transporters that bring these small molecules into the brain. Branch chain amino acids are super important for neurodevelopment and, frankly, for making neurons. And so they're so important, they actually get two shots on goal with these two different transport systems. If there aren't enough branch chain amino acids, these transport systems continue to grab the next guy in line, whatever that amino acid is. And then you see this imbalance, like we see with the glycine, serine, glutamine being high and the branch chain amino acids being low. So this is an example here. Again, the ASD subjects are on the left and the typically developing kids are on the right. And if you look at panel B in the bottom, you can see uh, glutamine, uh, the ASD subjects, the, the dots in red, um, are a little bit elevated. And the branch chains, which are isoleucine, leucine, and valine, the next three boxes, um, the subjects that are in the subtype in the ASD are low. There's, you can see it one false positive, I think, in leucine there on the right. Uh, in the typically developing column. And when we put these into a ratio, you see that what appears on the first panel, this is from our paper, where glutamine over isoleucine, glutamine over leucine, and glutamine over valine really pops out a group of subjects that are above a threshold. And that line that you see is the precision with which we now can diagnose this using our 
uh, test in our lab. So we can draw that line only because we have recruited 1,100 kids to do so. Um, and it allows us to pop out a subtype that you might not otherwise see. Um, we actually require the, um, the subjects to be positive for all three in this particular panel, so that the subjects that would be glutamine branch chain um, positive would be the 42 in the center of the Venn diagram. This helps to um, increase the specificity so we can remove some of the false positives and make sure that we're, if we say you're in the subtype, we have a 90, greater than 95% chance of being correct. There are a few false positives. In this particular case, it's actually 99.4% specific, so it's probably one subject that's a false positive. Positive, and it describes about 8% of the kids in the camp study. So, and similarly, we have a glycine panel and an ornithine panel. Same concept, just ornithine over each of the branch chains, glycine over each of the branch chains, and glutamine over each of the branch chains. Um, so then in totality, this is what we published in Biological Psychiatry, a panel that's actually then the combined all three panels, which actually can describe 16.7% of the children in the camp study. In the, that study population, it has a specificity of 96.3 and a positive predictive value of 93.5. Um, we also have additional subtypes, which are the subject of a, a publication in progress in that panel, which are neurotransmitters and neuroinhibitors, and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But in totality, the first panel can identify about 30% of the kids. Now, would I rather have it be 1 in 2 or you know, greater than 3 in 10? Absolutely, and we're working on that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But if you think back to the slide on genetics, if we take out fragile X, Down syndrome, and tuberal sclerosis, um, true idiopathic, not idiopathic, true genetic um, autism is only about 5% with all the markers and all the study we've, we've done. So if you get a genetic panel, your hit rate of actually having a gene is, is fairly low. Um, and that's not to say genetics is um, not important. It's just to give you a sense of relative description of how much can be described by each test. So. Um, we know that uh, autism can be diagnosed reliably through behaviors at age 24 months, and yet the average age of diagnosis in the country is four and a half. My son was seven. I think we do a little better than that now. Um, but we, we need to do better than that. And so what can we do with this test? We can diagnose as young as 18 months. And so what we do is screen the, t the, the child, and then we refer that on to a behavioral specialist. So you still need behavioral assessment because you have to get your ABA therapy, you need to get your insurance, you need to get your IEP. Um, but what hopefully it does is avoid the wait and see because Johnny's a boy and, and Susie's a girl and she talks a lot. So that was the first goal. But then we got greedy because we thought, you know what, we can actually do better. We can actually try to understand which thing makes a difference. And if I'm doing modified diet and putting all that effort into it, am I actually choosing the right modified diet? Is it what I'm taking out or is it what's left that's making a difference? And so we are working on that now in a much more in earnest. So who should have our test? We don't think this test should be administered, at least until we have a solution. If it turns out to be like an inborn error of metabolism and every kid needs to be screened for low branch chains at birth, we'll be talking about a different story. But right now we think this test is important for kids who are at risk. So that would be kids who have failed an MCHAT, who've regressed from a behavioral milestone, um, who have an older sibling who's already been diagnosed with autism because we know there's an enriched chance that that child will have autism. And interestingly, in the beta program, more than half of the children that are ordering the test through their doctor um, already have been diagnosed with autism. Because we know, you know, because you come here and you get these tests and you look at the supplements, that um, we want to try to understand more about the metabolism of our kids because we want to understand how can we intervene more precisely. Um, so more than half of the people who've ordered the test in the beta program were already diagnosed um, and wanted to know more about um, their child's metabolism. So as I mentioned, the test is available right now in 48 states. California should approve us this, this month, um, so we should be able to take samples from California. It's not yet approved in New York. New York is like kind of the biggest stickler for the CLIA lab uh, world, and it'll be probably two years before we can take samples from New York. We have had people drive over the river to you know either New Jersey or Connecticut to get a test, and it's between you and your God, but um, it's not uncommon for people to try to seek out a physician that's in a state that can order the test. Um, so all of the forms for requisition, the protocols and everything are on our website, but we encourage you to call us um, because we want to try to work with you to make sure you don't have to do it twice. So if you decide you want to order the test, um, we should definitely have a conversation about that. And as I mentioned, it does have to be first of the morning blood. So 
Um, if you have anything else you want to test that needs first of the morning blood, you could try to do it all at once and then try to avoid or even urine, try to get it done at, at one time. So PKU is an inborn error of metabolism. All our kids are actually tested for at birth. And this is where I referred to branch chains. If it turns out this is an inborn error, it will suddenly become part of our newborn screen. A generation ago or a little more, um, people were not screened for PKU um, at birth. And, and people who ate phenylalanine who cannot metabolize it become profoundly cognitively impaired. In, in fact, my best friend from growing up's cousin um, had PKU, and she was uh, very impaired. Um, and when we grew up and had children, my um, best friend had a child with PKU, and she was screened at birth, and she now goes to USC. And you know how hard it is to get into USC, even if you don't have a really wealthy movie star parent to buy you in. Um, and so you can conclude that she developed typically, um, and she observes a modified diet to do so. Um, and so what we think we have here is like an inborn error of metabolism, metabolism with like not a complete loss of function or almost a premutation, something that will probably be intervenable with a less extreme approach than eliminating phenylalanine from your diet. Um, this is a study by Garcia Carzola, which actually looked at the kids in the Mediterranean who have this complete uh, defect. And they showed that with, if they intervened with a high protein branch chain supplemented diet, in this case, they're doing it through an NG tube 24 seven, they actually improved the Vineland score of this child and reduced the irritability and hyperactivity of the child. Um, and similarly, the, the mice that I mentioned earlier that have this defect um, were intervened with a high protein branch chain diet and they also lost their autism phenotype. So there's good reason to believe that our hypothesis is correct, that we actually might be able to do something to help these kids um, by a supplement. So we've actually designed a study um, and we're raising money for it right now. And I wanna talk a little bit about it. The good thing about the camp study the wonderful resource that it is, is we can actually go and grab the 92 kids in camp that have this defect. We don't have to wait for one in six kids to show up with that defect. So we, we know where they are. I'll bet they'll be excited about just taking something as simple as a branch chain supplement to try to advance the science. So we're raising money um, to try to do that. And we wanna set it up as a randomized, uh, double-blind, placebo-designed study. Um, we're working with Denise Ney, who's a pediatric nutritionist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's an expert in amino acid nutrition, particularly for things like PKU, but also in neurodevelopmental disorders. So she's designed a formulation that's exactly um, formulated to meet the imbalance that we're looking at. Um, and we're trying to do both things with precision, not just the diagnosis, but also the treatment. So you can probably go to the store and get an athletic enhancing formula for branch chain that's meant for adults. It's not going to taste good because they're very bitter. It isn't designed with the balance that we hope we'll have for this that actually meets the need. Um, and it isn't um, scalable for the size of the human. So um, we're hoping to create something very precise to deal with this particular um, subtype. So we have a product actually in a budget for this. Um, and here's the clinical study. So this is how it would look. Um, you would have an intake where we get behavioral assessment. The clinician, uh, dietitian would speak with you. You'd have a blood work done to see what your branch chain level is using our test. Um, you'd also do a three-day di diet log so we can understand what you typically eat or your child typically eats. Then there'd be a 30-day washout period during which you would not be allowed to take supplements but could still take medicines. Um, and then we would do, again, a behavioral assessment, branch chain level assessment. And then there would be two arms to the study, um, a 90-day intervention three times a day with a supplement and 90 days with placebo. And then at the end, behavioral screening and branch chain level assessment. So the hope is that during that process, we would actually, you know, through scientific method, prove that this actually makes a difference. And we would publish it and we would hopefully continue to bring the research community and the progressive autism treatment community a little bit more in the same room. Um, and hopefully find a great solution for some of our kids. This is just the timeline. It's going to take about five quarters and about a million two to get this accomplished based on our projections. And we're pretty good at it now that we've had a five-year study that we suffered through. Bob's laughing again. He was with me suffering while we were trying to make payroll. Okay, so what else are we working on? Um, we're, we've done the branch chain uh, amino acid work, and that test is available. It describes about 30% of the kids. I'm going to talk next about the purine metabolism we just completed. Um, that ended up describing about 6.3% of the kids. And in this very week, we're validating um, an energy metabolism and mitochondrial function panel. 
Um, behind that, we have reactive oxygen species um, and methylation panel, and then the gut microbiome. So it's interesting, and you might not know, I didn't know before we did this work, that we can actually see byproducts of what your gut microbiome are making that they throw off into your plasma. And this is a little different approach um, because often that's done through stool, but we think it's interesting because if we can put a constellation of tests together with a single blood sample, that would have a lot of utility uh, for patients. So this is, the, this is the part where I wish Bob was standing here because this is so much biochemistry. And while I do have a master's of science, I'm mostly the business person at, at Stemina and NeuroPoint. But essentially what we're seeing here is purine metabolism. And what we observe in the kids in the CAMP study are higher levels of hypoxanthine and xanthine. Um, this is, again, an enzymatic-based um, issue. And we also see a correlation with taurine, which you don't see here on um, uh, on this particular diagram, but it's interesting because it has to do with sulfuration, which is an aspect of this that's important in understanding how things move through this pathway and then are actually excreted through, the, um, uh, through urine, uric, uric acid. Um, really severe mutations in this um, pathway result in Lesch-Nyhan syndrome, which has autism-like behaviors and other very sort of gruesome side effects, which I won't go into because it would depress us and that we don't need that today. But um, what we can say is this has been seen as being important in autism previously, and what we're trying to do is bring more precision to how we look at this. So here you can see that um, we actually identified a subtype, which is xanthine over uric acid. Again, the ASD subjects are on the left and the typically developing are on the right, and the kids in the subtype are in the red. This adds, um, it's uh, about 6.3% of the kids in camp that have this um, defect in metabolism, and the specificity is about 99% with a positive predictive value of 93.3. And again, this is in the camp study population. Um, but it only adds about 3.5% to our 30%. And there are some issues with sample collection here where xanthine and hypoxanthine are really um, highly correlated if we have more than 200 milligrams per liter of um, hemoglobin in the plasma. This happens when shearing occurs and the blood cells are broken during the collection process. So we're still looking at how could we use this as a test. Nonetheless, we're going to publish this data again in an effort to bring the research community uh, a little closer to the activist community that we have here and so that others can stand on the shoulders of our work. See how we're doing for time. Okay. So um, we have a publication in progress, and it includes the purine metabolism that I just mentioned, the energy metabolism, which is being validated this week. Um, and we know that the TCA cycle and mitochondrial function, energy function, is really involved in a, a good proportion of our kids. So we're pretty hopeful that we'll end up somewhere, the preliminary looks look, look says somewhere between 9 and 38% of the camp samples will have an energy metabolism component. Um, and so we'll know about that soon. And then we'll publish on the neurotransmitter, neuroinhibitor aspect of our panel, which is the balance of the about 12.6% of kids that equal 30% then in totality for this first panel. Because what we also know is people don't believe things if they, if they haven't seen them in a peer-reviewed journal. So we try to work really hard to do that. And even when we put them in peer-reviewed journals, there are certain academic scientists that like to take shots at us. But that's a subject for the bar later. <laughs> Um, so the neurotransmitters, we're looking at things um, like uh, glycine, kynurenin, which is actually in the tryptophan pathway and upstream of serotonin. We're looking at serotonin and GABA. And again, using a ratio kind of a concept to understand um, how can we pop out these subtypes of metabolism that have related biology, and how can we, we be really precise about telling that story? Now, each and every one of these is not going to be intervenable with um, a dietary supplement or a vitamin. Some of them will be targets for drugs. Some of them will be um, opportunities to repurpose drugs that we know address these particular areas of neurology um, in a way we never have done before. And we're trying to work with drug companies to help develop some of those as well. But we'd like to really take you know, the least uh, harmful potential intervention and start there, right? And then we, none of us want to get to psychotropic drugs if we don't have to. And so we are really trying to be very precise about how uh, we do that. So this is a case study. Uh, this is a set of twins that actually um, took, participated in the beta study, or the beta test program. Um, they're 74 months old. Um, they're fraternal twins. Um, twin A has a moderately functioning autism. And he wasn't responding well to behavioral therapy. And so one of our more progressive physicians, who was actually one of the principal investigators in our study, uh, the CAMP study, um, ordered the test for these twins. Um, and what we found was that the um, child was positive for one of the branch chain subtypes. 
Um, and so the physician started to work with an adult branch chain supplement to try to see if he could change behavior. And actually the mom is a nurse in Chicago and she sent me a video um, showing the child actually kicking a soccer ball around through cones at physical therapy and she reported that he was not able to do this before. Now that's the good news. The bad news is he also started IVIG therapy at the same time. So we don't know whether it has to do with the branch chain or the immune therapy that he's getting. But as you probably know, that's an expensive and not always covered intervention. And so we're actually retesting this child. Um, the first hypothesis is have the branch chain levels changed. If they haven't changed, we must conclude that it's probably the IVIG therapy that's making the difference. If they have changed, then we might mom might decide that she's going to remove the IVIG therapy and see what happens if she can uh, maintain the improvement with the branch chain. Uh, the other twin is actually high functioning um, and uh, he actually hit positive on one subtype, not the branch chain, but one subtype in our uh, panel. Um, and this child is not getting the branch chain uh, therapy. And so just an interesting anecdote. We're just early days in understanding where this is, but I just thought you might find it interesting. We certainly are following this case. Um, we also worked with uh, Denise Ney and the physician to um, make some suggestions about how to tweak the branch chain therapy with what's existing uh, on the market to try to increase the time in the gut and hopefully increase ab absorption. So we're learning as we go. Um, one of my big takeaways from this conference is that we need to have physicians and dietitians on staff because not all of us can have uh, Dr. Rosignol um, uh, at, our, at hand, and many pediatricians have no idea what to do with this data. And so we've been able to use the resources we have at, um, in our advisors um, to help intervene and give advice back to the doctor. Um, and this doctor is actually quite well versed in this area. We know we need more of that, and we're actually raising money to try to build that staff so that when you get a result, you actually get some meaningful help as well, even if you're not working with a physician who is as progressive as some of those that are here. So a little bit about our team. I mentioned uh, David Amaral um, and Marvin Natowitz. Um, Bob Burrier is here in the second row. He's our chief operating officer and VP of R&D. He's the PhD card carrying biochemist who helps me untwist my tongue from around my eye tooth so I can see what I'm saying. Um, and has been a great partner in helping us design an important study. Um, Heiner Dreisman is the former head of Roche Molecular Diagnostics. So one part of what we do is science, the other half is business, right? So if we can't deliver this test to you all and commercialize it successfully, it will go away and we won't actually accomplish our goal. So we need to put our eye on the prize in that regard and get advisors who can help us understand how to commercialize. And I mentioned Foundation Medicine um, as sort of the leader in thinking about oncology and biomarkers for treatment. So I recruited Kevin Kronetsky, who's the former chief operating officer and chief commercialization officer from Foundation Medicine to help teach me. How do we do this? How do we to attack this problem? Because we want to be successful, not just to do good things for the world, but also to help our investors get a return on investment. So there's a lot. It's very complicated to <laughs> try to manage, but it's very interesting too. And I feel like we're really making a difference um, in trying to advance the overall body of knowledge and the opportunity for earlier diagnosis and treatment. So um, that, I think, is the sum total of what I had wanted to say today. And I know that's a lot of science, but I have to say that um, when I talk with you all at my booth, and if you do have questions you don't want to ask here, we're going to leave a few minutes for questions. We do have a booth, and Bob will be there, and we can take your questions there. I'm so impressed with the depth of knowledge and the advocacy and the learning that all of you have um, taken. As a parent, I you know, had no idea about the resources that are available through this organization. I want to thank Taka for putting this together, um, for making this possible, a central place for all of us to learn not just the moms and dads, not just the researchers like me and, and our group, um, but all of us together, because we're all um, kind of united in a common purpose here, and that's improving the lives of children and families. So thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Um, are there any questions? Don't be shy. I have a question. Okay. So um, I have a child with low branch chain medicines, of all things. Interesting. And so we do supplement uh, just with over-the-counter uh, uh -huh. Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, first of all, it's going to include a protein component. So those peptides actually are um, help with abs absorption. 
Um, branch chains don't stay in the gut very long, so one of the things Denise advised this physician for the twin was to take it with fatty substances. So, yeah, so it stays in the gut a little bit longer for better absorption. And then we'll have um, a formula that actually has a balance between the branched chain amino acids that are appropriate for this particular uh, defect. Leucine is supposed to be a certain level higher than the other two. And there'll be some other amino acids included that will help to balance that out. I'm not a pediatric nutritionist, but she has helped us to put that formulation together. The other thing is, I don't know what your experience is, but branched chains are kind of bad tasting. They're bitter. You're used to that, but we're hoping to put together something that actually has a nice mouth feel and flavor that can be dissolved into something. Um, it could be a smoothie, it could be formula, it could even be water, if that's what you prefer. So, Yeah, fat is uh, what Denise uh, had suggested, just with the existing formulas for better absorption. Yeah. It is, yeah. Bob, do you have any answer to that? It may be part of the mTOR, which we talked about in our paper, but I don't, I don't know that we have a really good answer for that. Yeah, and this is part of the reason why we like metabolomics is that not everyone has the same gene. There may be another gene or genes that's associated with this, but we can't tra trace it back through, you know, the, whatever happens environmentally to us in life to what triggered it to turn on in the first place or turn off. Um, so I don't think we have a perfect answer for the genetic question, but in the end of the day, if we can see the downstream metabolism and intervene, that's the goal. Yeah. That's a good question. So right now the, um, the protein source is, is a whey byproduct, um, but I know that that's also something for the autism community. So I know Denise has another type of peptide in mind, and there's actually a, a biology that we're exploring. Was it University of California, San Diego, Bob, where they actually m synthesize the peptides so that they encapsulate um, with an enzymatic... Um, sort of break in the chain, just the actual small molecules that we want, the branch chains and a couple of other amino acids, and that one would not include a whey piece. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to present today and for your time and attention. I really appreciate it.